Now let's use MATLAB to find the derivatives and integrals of functions. That's numerical methods to repeat what you're going to do in Math 165 Calculus 1 and Math 166 Calculus 2. Let's start with Math 165 Calculus when you take derivatives. The derivative of a function is the slope. For example, at time 4, the slope of the function is the derivative at time 4. In calculus, you learn how to calculate the derivative for functions like sine, cosine, tangent, um, x squared. Here we're going to use MATLAB to use numerical methods. Numerically, the slope is changed in y over change in x. I can do that in a function. Given a function x and y, I can calculate the derivative. At any given point, it's the change in y over change in x. Put that in a function like so, and I can calculate the derivative. So copying that, going into MATLAB, file new function, paste. If I save that as my function derivative, given a function, I can now find its derivative. For example, if I have cosine, sine, I just computed numerically the derivative of sine as cosine. The blue line is sine, the derivative is the green line cosine. I can do that for real data. We go to NOAA's website, this is the CO2 levels on an hourly basis since 1958, actually monthly basis. If I copy that into MATLAB, I'm going to highlight it, copy, go to MATLAB, do data equals square bracket, start a matrix, paste, square bracket, and there's your data. Column 3 is the year. Column 5 is your CO2 levels. And there's your CO2 levels on a yearly basis. The derivative is how much CO2 is being added to the atmosphere every year. Using my function that I have for derivative, I cannot calculate that. You can see how much the CO2 levels are changing on a monthly basis. Kind of hard to see, but if I zoom in, a small part of that graph, you can see that on the integers, that's the change in the year, January 1st, CO2 levels are going up. That's winter in the northern hemisphere. In the summers, it's going down. That's the Earth breathing. When it's winter, CO2 gets exhaled. And the summer is inhaled, exhaled, inhaled. If I take the mean, on average, CO2 is being added to the atmosphere at a rate of 1.52 million, million cubic meters per month. Now let's do integration. Integration is the area under the curve. That's kind of useful. For example, if I have a wind turbine, I can produce energy the total energy I produce is how much energy or how much money I save. So I want to calculate the area or the integral. In Math 166, you learn how to calculate the integral of functions analytically. Here we'll do it numerically. Numerically, the area under this shape, that's the trapezoid, will be the average height, one half of uh, y of a plus y of b, times the width. I can write a function for that. Given a function x and y, the integral of y is just going to be the old integral plus the average height times width. If I copy that into MATLAB, file new new function and save it. I now have the function integrate that I can use. 
So with that, let's look at some wind speed data and find out how much energy I could produce with the wind. First, I'll go to the Endon Center. That's NDSU's Agriculture Weather Network. Uh, kind of a neat site. All across North Dakota, there are weather stations. If I pick one like Robinson, North Dakota, this is what it looks like. It's just a little weather station that measures sunlight, wind speed, humidity, rainfall, and so on. I want to go to weather data and find the hourly weather data for Fargo, North Dakota, average wind speed for the last four weeks. Um, I want to be in metric because anything English is, is a natural and kind of hard to use. And export to a file. Here's what the file looks like. The last column is what I care about. That's the average wind speed on an hourly basis. If I copy that, copy, go into MATLAB, wind is start of matrix, paste, end of matrix, that's the wind speed every hour at the height of 6 feet, 2 meters. Take the size, that's 672 data points. And that's what the data looks like. That's the wind speed 2 meters off the ground in Fargo for the last, last 4 weeks. If I want to build a wind turbine, like a Siemens wind turbine, on that site, these wind turbines aren't 2 meters off the ground, they're more like 80 meters off the ground. As you go up, the wind speed increases. It increases by about 80%. So if I scale that by 1.8, that's roughly the wind speed I'll have at the height of the wind turbine. Wind speed is not energy. If I go to the data sheets, and down here, this is a map showing the energy you produce versus wind speed. And actually, that's in megawatts, not kilowatts. Uh, at about 5 meters per second, I'll be producing 2.8 megawatts. That's not quite right. Typically, it's more like up here. At about 11 meters per second, it maxes out. At the rated power, 2.5 megawatts. So if I do that over here, the kilowatts I produce is a function of wind speed cubed. So that's at the height of the tower. If I scale it by 11, at 11 meters per second, it's equal to 1. At that speed, it's producing 2,500 kilowatts, 2.5 megawatts. Uh, the wind turbines actually do clip out. If you have too much wind speed, the wind turbines will break. So they clip at your rate of speed. This is actually about 2.6 kilowatts. If I clip it, that much, how much, that's how much energy that wind turbine will be producing over the last four weeks in Fargo. When you cite a wind turbine, you're kind of looking for this. I want it to be maxed out. That's using as much, generate as much power as you can. Anything below that, you're basically wasting money. I've got a wind turbine that's not producing as much energy as I would like. Uh, when you cite a wind turbine, you're trying to find different spots, spots where the wind is strong and the wind turbine is going to be maxed out. So this probably isn't the best site for a wind turbine. But regardless, uh, let's look at this. This is how much, how many kilowatts you'd be producing every hour. If I integrate that, that's how much energy I would produce or how much money I would save. So let's integrate kilowatts.
So ingrate kilowatts. And it helps if you spell it correctly. That's how many kilowatt hours I would produce from this wind turbine over the month, over the last four weeks in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, the total, the last data point, is the total amount of kilowatt hours I would produce. What that tells you is um, I would produce 743,000 kilowatt hours. That would save 743,000 pounds of coal. At 10 cents a kilowatt hour, it would produce $74,000 in revenue. There's two numbers you really need to know, the mean and the sum. That's also the sum of the kilowatts is kilowatt hours. Uh, the mean is at any given time, that's how much power I'd be producing on average. It's a 2,500 kilowatt wind turbine, only producing about 40% of that. The wind isn't always blowing, and this site isn't always blowing, giving a net result about 40%. The wind turbine is producing 40% of its rated capacity. This number right here is how many pounds of coal, or how much electricity you'd be producing. Uh, the homework is basically do that. Pick your hometown in North Dakota or your favorite site. Find the wind energy from the end on site, the wind speed. Calculate that to kilowatt hours for a Siemens wind turbine. And then see how much energy you would produce over a month, or if you really want, for a whole year.